three, two, one. John, are we live? We're live, sir. What's up, buddy? Not too much, my man. How are you today? I'm doing good. It's a long week for me. Uh, yeah. I got shoulder surgery on Friday, so mm -hmm. I'm just getting everything done so I can take a couple days and hang out at home and watch a new Netflix series or something. <laughs> Anything picked out? No, I haven't. You know, Peaky Blinders, everybody says I should watch. Really? Because I used to like um, Boardwalk Empire. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the British version of that, I think. Oh, okay. So that that's kind of a front runner. Very but good. If you have any suggestions, or if our guests have any suggestions, yeah, we can get into that. Sure. My way, because uh, I have four four or so days where I'm just not doing anything at all. Yeah, there was one with uh, Christina Applegate, and Maggie will know the name of it if she's watching. She'll she'll chime in. But I keep wanting to say "Better Off Dead," but it's not that. It's something dead. Uh, it was pretty. It was one season. Married with children. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Although those very reruns current. would probably be fun to watch. Oh, absolutely. You can't get away with the stuff now, but no. yeah. <laughs> no, it was. It, she'll hopefully she'll chime in and let us know. It okay, was. Cool. It was fun though. It was good. Uh, any shout outs? Well, my shout outs to you, and I, I'm almost bumping setting you for your shout out by doing this wow. for covering yesterday because I couldn't be here. So. You were able to uh, cover the uh, interview we had yesterday, and I was not able to make it in. And uh, shout out to you. I, I saw a clip, and you did an incredible job hosting. So if I'm not in for a few weeks, you just mm, take the show and run dun, with it, dun, buddy. Dun. <laughs> well, uh, you have a lot going on with what you got coming up, so you have to get your businesses in, in order. Not affairs. You're not going anywhere, but you know, you got to get everything set up so you can take a couple days off and relax and such. But uh, I'm going to use, actually, you're, you're correct. You did bump and set. A gentleman named Dennis Rodkin came into the studio yesterday. We pre-taped an interview. He is the residential real estate reporter for Crane Chicago Business. Super fascinating guy. Uh, very funny, very talkative, but insightful and smart. Uh, so what I told him, and I'm going to tell you, is... We're going to uh, put a small clip of our conversation out today. And then next week, uh, because you're going to be recovering, I'll be in studio. You and I are going to do a little FaceTime, uh, see how you're doing, check in with you, and release another clip or two uh, with Dennis uh, of what we did yesterday and kind of get your take and go back and forth like that. And then I'll put the whole thing on YouTube. So this is just... Uh, Number one out of probably three or four clips, but we did. He and I shot through an hour, like standing still. It was it was fun. So I'm gonna put this out, and then we'll come right back. Cool. If you don't mind, I, we just sort of jumped into yeah, it. Yeah, we but, did. We did. <laughs> but I would like to uh, learn a little bit about you and how you decided to get into real estate reporting, reporting it mm -hmm. at all, but the journalistic aspect of real estate. What drew you to that? Where did you start? And you know, what was your, what was your path? Short answer is somebody asked, my boss said, can you cover this? And that's in 1991 and 28 years later, I'm still doing it. He has retired and I'm still <laughs> on it. Um, right. I was a liberal arts major, English and English from a mm -hmm. small liberal arts college. That's not really going to, even in the 1980s, not going to get you a job. Okay. Um, and I went to journalism school at Northwestern. Very nice. And uh, was sort of casting around, doing all kinds of things. I covered school boards. I covered um, a lot of other topics. And mm -hmm. then in about 91, I was covering various things for Chicago Magazine. And a new editor of the magazine arrived, Dick Babcock. And he said, hey, I want to start a real estate column. You want to? That was 1991, wow. and when he was about to retire in, I think it was 2012, we were at a party, um, and he said, Dennis, you know, you're, you're doing a good job covering real estate. How'd you get into that? And I said, uh, you put me in it, <laughs> and he didn't even remember. So uh, 28 years later, I'm still doing it. So 28 years, he's been in the game, so he has seen a lot of change uh, in the Chicago proper and suburban landscape everything from the boom of the mcmansions to now the the west loop which we talked a lot about we'll release some of that next week uh but very insightful i'll be curious to hear your take on some of the things we touched on but very uh very nice guy and i already put in a reservation with him for uh after next year's election 
because I know you and I have talked uh, as far as real estate and a lot of other things, but real estate in general, that a lot of people are, are really just holding and not sure what to do as far as buying or selling when it comes to looking at November, because there's going to be some consequences. And we touched a lot on that. So a cool. lot's going to fall right into what you and I have talked a little bit about on air and off air. So yeah, it's he was really cool. I really enjoyed his company. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I know Crane does a really good job on the residential real estate side. Sure and do. yeah, I mean, with an election year, sometimes it's a crapshoot as to what's going to happen in the real estate market. So you've teased me with that clip because I obviously haven't heard it myself and right. I'm interested to get his take. Yeah. He probably has yeah. more experience now than uh, most people I'd come across. A lot of really fun stuff and, and we can, we'll talk more about it next week because we have two fantastic yeah. guests in studio. But uh, he, the one thing that I found uh, really interesting and fun is he reads, he subscribes to, um, I think it's just newspapers.com. And it's a subscription base, and you can read newspapers from decades ago. And he says that he reads every day, he'll read a, a Chicago newspaper from 100 years ago. Oh, that's crazy. Just to see what happened and kind of follow. It's really cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, so. you bump and set me for the West Loop. Yes, we I have did. T- Today in the <laughs> studio, we have a comeback guest, the second time around the show. And then a second Mo, which is a first for us. I know, right? Pretty excited about that. And we have wine in studio, so that's cool too. Um, I'm going to introduce our first guest, who's our comeback guest, and then I'm going to probably get into a roundtable sooner than I normally do with Mo as well. Um, Our first guest is Derek Westbrook, and I'm going to read this off because I don't want to butcher this. You've done a lot. (laughs) He's a Michelin star certified sommelier. Um, Wine Enthusiast Magazine had him as a 40 under 40. He was also on the cover of Wine Enthusiast Magazine. If I butcher any of this, stop me and let me know. He's been in Eater Magazine, Chicago Magazine, Chicago Tribune, been on ABC, WGN, and NBC, and on Wheelhouse now twice. (laughs) See, that's the big one. (laughs) I left the best for last time. Of course. Thanks for coming on. Tell us about your new venture at 1340 Beer, Wine, and Spirits. And then for those who are listening for the first time to a show with you, tell us how you got involved in wine in this whole world. Yeah, um, I can't believe all those things. Actually, like we, when I hear that list, it's a little surreal. So, well, congratulations! You've, <laughs> you've done so much. Yeah, <laughs> I've been busy. I'll be your, I'll, I'll be your hype man anytime yeah, you want. Uh, if I if you could just have that intro forward to everything, <laughs> we'll just so. follow you around. And, yeah, <laughs> now we're entering the restaurant. Well, we chat with Mo. We'll see if he'll have me on as your hype man every time you come out from now on. Um, yeah. So how I got into the wine industry, I kind of just fell into it. Um, I'll give you the somewhat succinct version, but I worked at a small Italian restaurant while in college. Uh, so I went to the University of Alabama, Birmingham. I worked at a small Italian restaurant called La Voice. From there, I learned about wine, um, and I learned the storytelling behind wine, as well as you know the science of it. Uh, so there, you know, that's when I think it first bit me. I, it was supposed just to be you know a job while in college, and it became a love, a passion. Um, so much so that I moved to Chicago to pursue working in the wine industry because you know Chicago's what we call a a, a market for wine, wine, beer, and spirits. It's top three markets in the U.S. So I moved here looking for some adventure, and you know, and I found it. <laughs> and I've been I've been in the game ever since. And so that was you know 2012 when I moved here in Chicago, and, and here we are 2019 and. You know, no looking back. Drank a lot of wine in Chicago, I'm guessing. Yes, I <laughs> drank a ton of wine in Chicago. Yes, yeah, my wine mate, my wine drinking in Chicago has become extraordinary and <laughs> in comparison. I think I touched on this with you last time you were on, but I'm going to ask it again. Yeah. For most people, and I'm, I'm talking about myself too, wine is a little bit of an intimidator for me. So if I'm going to a restaurant yeah. and I'm, ordering wine, if I'm on a date, or even if I'm out with friends or on a business setting. And I have had the um, privilege of having you on, and I've learned a little bit from you. I went to Napa this year, so I think I'm probably better than the worst of the worst people who go to restaurants. What do you recommend to somebody who's very nervous about ordering wine? Is it go test more wines? Is it just keep seeing what you like, get an understanding of different areas where wine comes from, the different types of wine? What would be your advice to somebody like me who is just 
I would say an amateur. Okay. Yeah, I would say try everything, you know, like taste and try everything. So, um, and then additionally is, you know, try things you've never heard of, ask questions. I think find a local wine shop that you really love buying from. And, and the reason why I say like a local or a small wine shop or somewhere where you, a person will end up knowing your name, knowing who you are, and then they can kind of guide you through that process. And they'll do it in a way that's, typically usually warm and inviting um and then you know i think it's always ask questions don't be afraid to ask the dumb questions because there are none you know um i think that level of curiosity is key and yeah i think you know if if everyone is drinking it go drink something else right okay because and the reason i say that is because everyone's drinking it then there's you you're not really learning anything right if you're always only drinking cab then like go try another grape you may love it or hate it and you know especially if you're doing like glasses i always say go cheap and go obscure right okay. to learn more and and ask questions and you'll be good well i found a wine shop just yeah. by searching around <laughs> a little bit it's called 1340 beer wine Interesting. <laughs> um, tell me and, and in all seriousness you guys do a lot of really cool events there you're doing wine clubs you're doing wine tastings and then you have a um, uh, a wine class, right? Yeah. So there's a club, a uh, tasting, and also classes. Yeah. Tell me about all, all so that yeah. you guys do there. So 1340 Wine, Beer, and Spirits. So we're we're located at 1340 West Madison. So makes it easy. Name. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, think of us as what we call a slashy. So we're a wine shop where we sell wine, beer, and spirits. But then we also have a wine bar that we just put in several months ago. And so with that space. We've created a wine club where you can come in and we have a list of six different wines. So you come in each month, you do a tasting, a free tasting of those four of those six wines and you pick two bottles that you like the most, the two wines that you like the most and you take that home. And as a benefit to that, additional benefit is you get, you know, 10 bucks off of any of the wine classes. So I teach a wine class once a month. Um, and we rotate through topics. So everything from a survey of Cabernet across the world to a survey of Pinot Noir across the world. We've also done like regionally specific. So, you know, Northern Italy versus Southern Italy. So we have that class. And that is my way to kind of educate the populace because I think the more people know about wine, then then they become better buyers. Um, and I want to demystify it just a bit, right? Because I think the issue becomes is a lot of sommeliers think of themselves as, oh, I'm elevated because I know more. And for me, the goal as a sommelier is I want to help people drink good, right, yeah. and have fun. And if I can eliminate the need for me to have to be around, then I'm off somewhere just drinking, having fun, right? Right. So so that's our wine club. That's our class. Um, and then we do free tastings every Thursday from 6 to 8. So then that's the hook, right? That's how to get people in. And we always show obscure stuff. So it gets you interested, it gets the curiosity going, and which goes back to my point of, you know, how do you learn more? You come to 1340. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. That's where I got to go Thursdays <laughs> from 6 to 8. When is your next class? So the next class is I will actually be out of town doing that, so we're going to have someone else fill in. On my next class, we do classes on the second Tuesday of each month. Okay. So I'll be in D.C., unfortunately. Okay. But um, we're having someone else fill in and do that, but I'll definitely be there for the – December and January classes. So second Tuesday of each month, wine classes. Very cool. And how long ago did you get involved? So I, I we always butcher this, Cody and I, because it feels like we've known each we've known each other for four years, and I've been around. I think I officially became a partner roughly about seven, eight months ago, um, and then we remodeled roughly about five, six months ago. Very neat. Yeah. And this is a question I, I, I've asked a couple people. Do you find that? the average wine amateur like myself or a lot of people listening tend to go sweeter wines? Yeah, so the American palate is sweet. And even when we talk about like Cabernet and Zinfandel, right? When we talk about those red wines, they're actually sweeter. They're, they're not considered sweet wines. They're not dessert wines, but they have a lot of fruit or what I call ripeness. So the way to think about it is you think about a piece of fruit, right? So... American wines, the climate's warmer, 
So then the growing season is longer. So then the fruit gets more ripe, right? So the r more ripe a fruit gets, the sweeter it gets. So then when you ferment, you're fermenting the sugars out. But because it has that low, high, high level of sweetness initially, even when you ferment out most, if not all the sugars, the wine gets dry, but it still has that fruity, sweet note to it. Um, whereas you'll find like wines that are grown in other places like I always use France as an example because it's easy they have typically a lot of the areas have a shorter growing season and the rules and regulations are much higher or not higher but there's a lot more rules and regulations in, yeah in French winemaking like what grapes you can use in what areas um, you know picking time of year that you can pick what you can do like manipulation there's a lot more rules around that whereas here in America it's you know the Wild West, if you will, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is great because it's great for innovation, yeah. but can be problematic for um, setting the tone of what is good and what's not, right? So, you know, it, anything can happen. You can pretty much do, in some areas, do whatever you want, which is beneficial, but can be negative at the same time. Now, this might be a very loaded question for you because you might say, I, I love a bunch of them. Do you have some favorites? Everything. Um, <laughs> Everything. I think the one thing I've been drinking a lot of recently um, is wines from Prirat, Spain. So the reason why I love Prirat is there's this Catalonia. So you have Monsant, which is like you think of it like a circle, and within that circle is Prirat. So Monsant is super hilly, almost mountainous. So, and then Prirat, which is in the center, is basically a mountain. You're basically putting a vineyard on a mountain. And the problem with that is it's a mountain, <laughs> so it's super steep. So it's, it's so sheer that they have to cut terrace into the cliffs in order to plant vines. And that produces really big, weighty, huge wines, right? And that's nice, but I like them as they age as well. So it's cool because you, you get the best of both worlds. If you want something, like, big, powerful, then you drink it young. But if you want something that has to get kind of, like, more velvety, creamy, softer, floral texture that comes out as as these wines age and i love that about them and then the white wines are fantastic and they only make a small percentage of white wines but they're phenomenal they must have laughed at me when i went to napa because i knew nothing i can imagine him going in there and having a conversation with somebody in napa or sonoma or spain and then i come in there and i'm just tasting the samples that they give me looking like i don't know anything at all yeah well i'll, I'll tell you this so it's funny a lot of times when people are talking to me and they're talking about wine like there's this there's some some genuflect or some may feel like uncomfortable and it's like yo like there's two rules that I have right one is is it yummy let's talk about yummy and then we can talk about why you do or don't like something and then the number two thing is like it's grape juice <laughs> like when we at the end of the day we're talking about grape juice so like I want I like to diffuse kind of that yeah. I need to know or I need to impress or I'm scared to say anything it's like first of all I probably heard every question in the, in the world. Uh, that you can ask about wine, whether you know every quote unquote dumb question you can ask, and so there's not something that someone's gonna ask that I probably haven't heard, and I know I don't know the answers to everything, so like it's I always say like it's just grape juice, guys. Like, well, you have a crazy passion for it, and I, I can tell. I mean, you went from this, like you said, it was supposed to be a college job, then it turned into a passion, and then you made it to the point where you're on the cover of basically the largest wine magazine, and then. Having becoming a Michelin star sommelier <laughs> to now owning a, 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 a wine beer. I don't want to just say it's wine. It's wine, beer, and spirit shop. Yeah. Uh, you've taken a passion, and it's become kind of a life for you, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah. I can tell. I just wish I had one thousandth of his knowledge when I was <laughs> right. sitting there exactly. in Napa. <laughs> yep. You'll appreciate the story. So I, obviously, when you're in Napa, mm -hmm. they want you to buy their wine. All so right. I felt bad. My, my friend Sean was bought some wine and I was like, well, now I got to buy some wine. And he, he was, the gentleman was super nice at the uh, winery and, you know, he's like, so what do you like? And I said, sweeter wine. So he said, well, this is the sweetest, but he didn't tell me it was port. He didn't mm. tell me it was like dessert <laughs> wine. So I ordered a case of what ended up being like dessert wine. And I wasn't just going to drink that all the time. So I gave them away as gifts and yeah. people loved them. And I actually really liked it too. But I famously, instead of just ordering a case of just wine, Ended up ordering dessert wine. <laughs> yes, because I just didn't know any yeah. better. And the and the thing about it is like, like that stuff is yummy. Like I like poor yeah. wine. You know what I mean? Like I think the other thing is like this misnomer of like, oh, you're not a real wine drinker unless you're drinking like dry red wine. It's like, 
No, for me, a real wine drinker is a person who can appreciate all of the categories. Yeah. You have your favorite. Yeah. Drink your favorite. If you want to put ice in your Chardonnay, do it. Like, don't stress about that. Yeah. It's all about the curiosity, and it's all about, like, knowing what you do and don't like and willing to explore. I'd rather, I'd rather you have no knowledge or I'd rather you only exclusively drink sweet wine but then have a knowledge of all the wines yeah. or have a curiosity to at least will try everything. That's the only thing I care about. And so, yeah. like, I think that's funny. I think it's hilarious because there's times where I'll pour wine for people and not tell them because I don't want them to have the preconceived notions. Like Riesling is one of those grapes where everybody thinks wine Riesling has to be sweet. It can be sweet or dry. And the fun part about that is a person will come up and say, I hate Riesling, but I love dry white wine. And I'm like, Perfect. I got you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and and that's fun for me. And it's not to be a jerk. Like, it can come off jerky sometimes, if, you know. But it's to show you that, yo, like, try it all. Yeah. And try stuff you don't like. There's wines that I taste that I don't like. And I know I'm not going to like it, but I need to taste it in order right. to have an understanding for it. And every once in a while, I get surprised. And that's the fun part. See, that's what I got to do. Because I'm a curious person. I'll try anything once. Um, so I got to try all different types of wine because I've settled into a comfort zone. I said this off air where I just like champagne now. So if I'm ordering stuff or if I have a choice, like I'll just go to that because it's my safe. Yeah. My Champagne's safety fire too. Champagne. That's my safety fire. net there. So yeah. I just go there because I'm like, ah, oh, it tastes good and I like it. And yeah. That's yeah. what it is. When in me. doubt, go with what you know. And yeah. you know, and then, but, and the, the cool thing is like the level of curiosity and plus, you know, you got a local wine shop that you can. I know. Now explore. I got to, now I got to come by. <laughs> I, 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 I said this last time and I, and I haven't done it. I genuinely want to learn more. So yeah. I have to be curious. I got to come in and yeah. who better to learn from. So you brought some wine. Yes. Um, let's give it a, let's give it a shot. What do we yeah. have? So we have a uh, forest song Syrah. Um, so this is a Syrah out of Columbia Valley. Um, Washington and what I love about it is Syrah is one of those grape varietals that is you know it's well known enough that if I say it you won't be like what is that but having it, its identity is a little obscure because of where it comes from like you know you find Syrah originally like I like Syrah from southern France like Rhone Valley um, I like like those kind of opulent wines but th in this case this is like 2013 is the vintage, if I'm not mistaken. So what happens with wine as it gets older, it starts to it starts to lose a little color, and it starts to what we call it, like soften, like mellow out a little bit. And so then you get secondary and tertiary flavors. Now, do you need to know any of anything I'm saying in order to enjoy the wine? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I tell people, I was like, look, ultimately, I'm going to give you all the game you need. Do you need to remember it in order to enjoy it? Heck no. no. Right? So, yeah, so this is just red wine from Columbia Valley, Washington. Um, I know I was talking crap about California and, you know, American wine, but this is one of my favorite American wines um, just because of the way it's made. It's just really well made, and it has a, some age on it, and it's not going to break the bank either. So, How much is this bottle? So this bottle is, I think, 28 bucks. Oh, not bad at oh, all. Not bad. Yeah, not bad at all. So. Well, I'm going to take this time to introduce our second guest, John, because he's going to about to drink with us, and I want to introduce sure. him yeah. as we begin to drink. And I'm not going to butcher your last name. I'm not going to butcher his first name because his first name is Mo. <laughs> <laughs> so Mo NG, right? NG. NG. I effed it up. It's okay. Yeah. I, I even like Two wrote syllables. it out. First of all, you're a lot closer than a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he also told me before we came on air, so I was I was close at least there. Uh, Mo is the founder creator of Dim Events, Mo Management, and then a project that he's in a company that he's working on with you, Derek, Samples and Samples. Correct. Right. So Mo, welcome on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Let's drink this thing, and then we're going to get into everything that you do. Um, Cheers. Cheers. John's got Cheers. one too. Absolutely. Terrible, I know, right, guys? No, <laughs> that was really good. This is my wow, that's mm. nice. That's really nice. You know what you taught me last time was don't grab the yeah the uh, wine glass like this. Yes, yeah. like like a full Stem grab. It. Yeah. Stem it. Stem it. Stem. And and now like when I see people grab it, I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh no, I got, got something. Meet, you got to meet Derek. Derek taught me something. <laughs> so this is funny. It's something you can unsee. And 
for me, right, one of the quirks is in movies, like, I'll I'll see people grab it improperly in movie and TV, and I'll be like, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> why? Especially if someone's, like, if, like, there's someone who's, like, supposedly sophisticated, and then they grab it by, by like, the bowl. It's like, oh, well, I don't believe you anymore. I don't believe the character anymore. Yep. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so I want weird. my money back. <laughs> it's, my, it's my own little tick. Like, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. Right, but it's my own little tick. <laughs> because of you, I cannot unsee it at restaurants. <laughs> it is when people grab it like this. I was like, "You don't know what you're doing." <laughs> Neither do I. But at least I got one step up. <laughs> so you taught me that. Yeah. And I, I was thinking when you were pouring it, I am not grabbing it by the glass. <laughs> I learned something I last time. Yeah. So uh, Mo. Tell us what you do with Dim Events, Mo Management, and how you got to know Derek. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Dim Events started as uh, kind of like a nightlife company. Um, just give you a quick backstory. I went to DePaul University, and that's kind of how I came to Chicago. And um, we noticed uh, that there was no market for students who were um, under 21. So we would rent people's houses out and throw parties. And the first party we threw, uh, in the first two hours, we ended up like getting a keg and all of this stuff and made it work and had a cool experience. Um, but we made $1,500 in two hours. So I was like, whoa, whoa this is crazy, especially for a college kid who's yeah. 18. Um, so that kind of helped us break into the Chicago nightlife scene. And we did that for like the next two to three years. And then we started working with um, actual nightlife companies. So... I ended up interning with Rocket Ranch Production, and that's really where I kind of got my name and um, the promotion and marketing and helping out with their um, fashion show that they would have to kind of push early traffic at Underground. So that's how I got started in that world and then slowly shifted over into more experiential events because I noticed like around 24-ish, 25-ish um, that a lot of my friends weren't going out, so it was getting tougher. And like building those teams to kind of promote, we had to go a lot younger than older. Um, so we started doing like dinners, we started doing art shows, and through that, I would brand those individuals who were being a part of the event. So those might be painters, those might be chefs, um, and working with them, um, <coughs> noticed that it was creating a platform for them, and I started to build that in my own manner. And now Dim Events has kind of grown into a little more where we're doing video production, brought on someone who's doing social media, um, and now one of my favorite passions is internship building. So that really stemmed from a, a need basis. When I was in corporate, I used to meet with my interns like every Sunday, just because Monday through Friday didn't really work for yeah. me. Um, so I'd meet with them every Sunday to like give fresh ideas, kind of see what they're seeing in the market. And then I would apply that to the clients that I had working my corporate job as well. And then that turned into them being like, man, I love this. Like, you should turn this into like a class. And I was like, really? I never thought about that. Um, but I also saw like tapping into my network and introducing them to career fields that they wouldn't never thought of um, became very became something that was very passionate to me. Um, especially coming from Minnesota where I didn't know like this could be a career field that I could really tap into. So now going into like Mo Management, that started off where one of the artists who had been in our show, uh, A Sounds, um, that we ended up doing like a 500 larger, 500 person larger event with uh, Milagro Tequila. He was like, man, every time I come here, I sell all these paintings. Like, and this is the place where I usually get like, you always put the artist first. So I was like, yeah, like that's the whole point of this instead of just like making money off of it. So um, Davey was actually one of the artists that I worked with as far as management. And then that turned into a comedy group asking me to get them a venue. From there, we ended up, they ended up asking me to like kind of procure all of their events, um, which turned into a management situation. Uh, and then doing a small Midwest tour with them, which was really cool. And then shooting a pilot um, with Stephen Wolf Theater, um, kind of bringing in like a comedy act for Stephen Wolf, which is something completely different. Yeah. And then that kind of led me to Derek, where 
we had a mutual friend Langston, and actually, yeah, I, Derek always forgets about this part about the story, right? <laughs> Selectively <laughs> forgets. Yes, always forgets about it. So I'm gonna air it Selective out. Selective memory here. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, I, I got it go. too. Oh. <laughs> I think, I think, I think. Huh? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm just. So Langston is our mutual <laughs> friend, and um, Derek had. It makes sense now, but Derek had started the what was what was the wine company you had? Oh, so I had the Wineman, um, yeah. which is a wine company where we did like wine tasting and home wine tastings and and, that. and we did it on a really small level. But yeah, yeah. So he had started that, and he had told me about it because he knew I was kind of veering off into experiential. He was like, "Oh, you and Derek should should connect." So he put us in a group text. And I responded, and I never heard anything from you. Oh, oh, man. So you ghosted him. <laughs> ghosted me. So what had happened was. No. <laughs> so during he that time. He lost his phone. <laughs> right. So during that time, I was at Elizabeth restaurant. Um, was it? Yeah, I was at Elizabeth. And, and we were, I think, while when I got the group chat, was in the middle of a menu change. Hmm. And. Like when we change menus, so chef would change menus roughly about quarterly, um, and so when we go into menu change, like everything shuts down. So I basically spend the entire time like building pairings, tasting chef's food, trying to figure out what we're gonna do. And so there, you if you look through like text messages, you can see where like I'll get like twenty text messages that I've read and not responded to any of them because I'll just look at them and then be like, oh, okay. And so that was definitely one of them. And I was like, man, I don't want to like, I don't want to take on anything else. Like, I could meet him, and he could be dope, but I'm good. <laughs> like, 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 I'm good. I'm tired. Like, I don't want to think about any other opportunities. And uh, and then ultimately, we end up we uh, he kind of curated us meeting through his uh, birthday, our friend Langston. So I mean, you can you can tell the story. Yeah, that. we met there. It was, it was crazy. It was good. To your credit, I don't like seeing um, notifications on my phone. So I'll read text messages even when I'm busy, and mm -hmm. then sometimes forget to go back. Yeah. But the, I'm glad you guys finally got to connect. Yeah, we did. Yeah, the, at the time, it was like the way it happened and when it happened was actually perfect. Like it was. And it meant more because I could time. really see him in action. Yeah. Because at that time, I knew nothing about spirits and I was drinking Hennessy as well. <laughs> and he came in there and he was like talking very passionately about um, this cognac that I never heard about. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who does he think he is? <laughs> and then and he was like, yeah, you should try this. And I tried it. I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, he knows what he's talking right, about. Right, he knows what he's talking <laughs> about. And Lex is like, oh, yeah, this is the guy I was trying to connect <laughs> you with. And we literally met, I think, like that Monday yeah. at the Virgin Hotel um, and came up with the idea of samples and samples. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah. So tell me, Mo, tell me about samples and samples. Yeah, so, and I think Derek can obviously speak to samples and samples a little better, but. But I like, I like the way you talk about it more than the way I talk about it. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so for samples and samples, like, that was perfect for me because I had no understanding of the wine industry. I was like, oh, yeah, wine, sophistication. This is, like, perfect for my life. You were like this, Mo. Yeah, I was literally, <laughs> I knew nothing. So I was like, okay, yeah, let's try it out. Um, and. I think, and the one thing that we did talk about was just like, this is going to be a very hard concept for us to break um, for the consumers that I had, which was, um, I'm trying to think, that's probably like 25, 26, yeah. I mean, I had 24, 25 around that time. Um, and yeah, I was just like, this is going to be tough. So let's do it on my birthday, right? Um, and for me, my birthday has always been something where I know I can bring people out during that time. So I would always put on whoever I was working with, right? So the chef that I was working with, he did the event on that Friday. And then we did samples and samples on Sunday because my birthday's on Labor Day weekend. Um, and we had a pretty good turnout. Yeah. Um, it was definitely tough getting all of those people <laughs> out, trying to break even on the expenses because oh I do all the numbers. Like, that's my thing. Um, but, yeah, it was a great event. And samples and samples is basically – um music well typical wine tasting meets uh live concert right um and we always uh represent that live concert element with the dj and now we're trying to grow it and move towards like live music and like change 
the idea of what a wine tasting is and what's in the wine industry, right? Because I think it's perfect for Derek and I because I don't know anything about wine, but I'm okay with that. And, and you're great at event planning right. and putting on yeah. a party. Exactly, yeah. and building a community yeah. around that. Um, and that's where I bring in my expertise and I leave all the wine yeah. stuff to Derek. And the cool part is, is Mo is a great, like, I think all of my friends, most of my friends are in the wine industry, right? Like I have a couple that are, um, but it's great talking about wine with, with like my friends who aren't in the wine industry or who may even be somewhat of a novices. And the reason being is, like they give me a good barometer on how to talk to the public about it, right? Great and like point. they can give me an understanding of like, does this work? Does this make sense? Are my concepts landing, right? And and then it teaches me how to take this really difficult concept and break it down and make it bite sized for people, and to do it in a way that's really warm and inviting. So, so the great thing about like this marriage is <clears throat> that like Mo provides that space, right? And as he learns about wine, because he's a really fast study, as he learns about wine, like he can see where I'm trying to come from as well. So it's like he's really been a really great bridge, right? And it's funny, he's becoming a bridge and he has been a bridge to like understanding what the consumer is trying to get, right? And he understands the concept that's in our heads because we created this thing together, so. Well, yeah, what a great partnership because a lot of times, and we've had partners on the show, we've had, uh, people talk about partners and a lot of times you have to have very differing strengths like I look at John and I even in this we have very differing strengths but uh, being able to connect on what the two people's visions are is so important and I can tell you to do that and Mo I know from your standpoint you probably have a very good grasp on trying to see uh, into somebody's vision and understanding someone's vision because what you're doing with um, taking a brand or taking a person and being able to uh, manage them and not only give them a platform to grow, but almost help them bring their story out. Because I, I always say, people, everyone has a story. It's just some people can't get that story out. 100%. And I can tell you've obviously through experience and through just having a um, a talent for it, are able to then pull that out. 100%, and like yeah. you said you really needed somebody who was not a wine expert to be your partner 100%. in this because if he was a wine expert, you might not, that's not the general public. Right. You know, he, now you're kind of, I mean, you went from being a novice <laughs> to probably an intermediate where he's an advanced, yeah. but you were a novice and you were able to kind of pull all that out of him. So what a yeah. cool partnership yeah. you guys yeah. got. It's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't it, it great keeps it, it keeps it fun. Yeah. Especially, <laughs> yeah. Just learning about like all these wines where he's like and it takes Derek to like for me right i think of it as just it's just wine right yeah but like grape juice right grape juice grape but like when we're in when we were in bordeaux like just being in the in that space and learning about all these like baller wines he's like look nobody these like nobody would that's not their starting point of like learning about yeah. wine <laughs> and that's where it's just like okay cool so when i when i'm out with my friends i'm like don't touch the wine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that that is funny. It's like, like looking back, I, I I think about like like most starting point with wine is like he gets to start with like some really dope wines. Like his starter is, I always say like, since Mo met me, he's never had a bad wine in his life, right? Like, and and like pat on the back to me if you will, but it's really cool to see and really be able to like watch somebody go through that maturation and go through that maturation in a way that they get to see some really awesome stuff because I get to see some really awesome stuff. And I think yeah. we're just we're really fortunate to be in that space where like I get to, you know, I outkick my coverage and kind of like the things I have been able to experience in life thus far. And it's cool to have someone who like gets that and understands that and somebody who's like, oh, who understands when we were, you know, we couldn't get 30 people in a room at one point in time. <laughs> like, like, we couldn't get 30. Like, I'm on the cover of a magazine, and two years prior to that, I couldn't talk 30 people into a room to do samples and samples. And now we're going to be in Stanford University doing samples and samples so for cool. 200 students, right? So we cool. couldn't get 20 people, and now we're doing 200 students. And, and, you know, a year, maybe two years' time. So it's crazy. So tell us what you're doing at Stanford. 
So yeah, so Samples and Samples, the Wine Tasting Meets DJ concert, we're doing it for the students. So we're doing it for roughly 200 students um, at Stanford University. So they're flying, flying us out to do it. So we're in and out, you know, we're doing it on Friday. Uh, so right around Halloween, which is crazy. So the day hungover. after Halloween, yeah. right. some hungover Stanford yeah, yeah. students. So it's gonna be it's gonna be great, and hopefully you know hopefully some people will come in, in Halloween costumes the day after Halloween, and <laughs> the walk of shame right into your right, right. So, 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 so it's gonna be great, and I think it's a it's a really great way to like kick off the weekend, and it's super exciting. So, I'll, I'll. and we're doing it a little differently with this one. Um, we are going to work with their art center. So yeah. they have the Cantor Art Center, and they're going to work on curating. Um, actually, I, I, I can't even elaborate on it because yeah. they haven't it's really so told weird. me everything. Yeah. But, uh, but basically, they're going to take art pieces that uh, go hand in hand and, and pair with uh, Derek's um, music and wine pairings to so create cool. a so visual you're a third experience. Element, really. Yeah. 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 And how do you guys, so do you both sit down and obviously you're the wine expert, but do you both sit down and say, okay, this wine to me works with this song? How, how does that process kind of work yeah, itself so out? So it, sometimes it, it depends. Like sometimes we go wine first, sometimes we go music first. Um, like if there's a record that I'm really passionate about that I think works and feels right for the crowd, um, I'll pick that record and then build on, like find a wine that fits in that slot. Uh, a lot of times I like to start with the wine first because there is like making sure we find the right wine. Like there's a lot more moving parts to picking wine than there is to picking records. So I try to do the hardest thing first, which is pick the wines and think about the story I want to tell and then find the records that feel right to that story that kind of fit. So it's this kind of, you know, is it puzzle pieces, Tetris, whatever you want to call it, like that's what we do. And that, and then that's where like Mo and I will collaborate more so on picking records together. Cause we want to make sure that they, like they resonate. Cause the key, right? For me is I'm picking wines that I, I resonate with me and then I can share. And so with music, you have a vast opportunity to pick so many different songs, so many different feelings. So we're trying to find stuff that like connects on a broad scale so like picking like really big records but then we always i want to show you something new and unique sometimes too so finding those kind of niche records that i think are i love that you'll walk away singing in your head and not and be like where did that song come from right so it, it's that balance and we we go back and forth sometimes we fight about records and fight we have all the time yeah. about <laughs> yeah, we do. We well, do. that just means you're listening to more music and drinking more wine <laughs> throughout the process of finding the right one 100 yeah. and like we're and we always like we have really great banter about like you know who like who got what right like because it's always fun to see like what record hits the hardest mm -hmm. um and it'll come out of left field like it's it's funny like what records really work and what records don't that um, maxwell so thinking about like so what we didn't talk about is the tour that we did right yeah. after he got on the cover um and we worked with city winery and we did uh i think it was like six six, six different cities, cities. Yeah, i think so um but we ended up, we were trying to start in Nashville, his hometown. That didn't work. So we had to start in Atlanta, which was like very worrisome because yeah. we didn't really have anyone in Atlanta. Um, and then we literally got to Atlanta and like, yeah, we it sold out. Yeah. <laughs> we were, we <laughs> came out of a meeting and it, was, it sold out and people were hitting him up. And they're like, hey, we need more tickets. So my job is to run and chat with City Winery. Like, hey, we need to open up all these tickets. So. I think that was the biggest one that we did. We did yeah. like eighty seats, I yeah. think. As Very well. cool. Yeah, but For our first in one. a market that you hadn't been to in the first no, one. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never been there. Yeah, we never done so. It was in that market ever before. Yeah, and Very the cool. thing was. We were going back and forth, like so. For my my job is like I'll comment on the music, but I don't want to get too much in there because my job is to set up the artist for that. So that's where like me finding the DJ um, is tough. So what we did on our tour was we found all um, women DJs in uh, the different cities that we went to, and then that's where the DJ and Derek have that conversation yeah. to do something that's organic and mean something to the place that we're in right 100%. and have a little bit of those elements in there and then i'll like comment on it so like the maxwell song that yeah. he was like 
he was like, no, we have to do this for two days. I was like, no, I think we should change it. I don't think it's going to hit. And we didn't know who was going to be in the yeah, room. You so you have no idea who's going to be there and who's, like, what their music palette is. And that Maxwell song hit, and I was like, dang. <laughs> and I had, and I, you know, I had to let him know about it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. did you remind him about oh, yeah. it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to let him know. Wouldn't stop. <laughs> He's admitting it like you've been reminding him about it since those two days. Yes. You see, I didn't have to, you see, I didn't bring it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's the one that brought it up. It humbled me. <laughs> but, like, and I think, like, that, that happens where, like, you know, Mo would be right about stuff, and, you know, I don't want to admit it, but. Yeah, he's right. Like so, I think that that's one of the things that works. And the cool thing too, when we're circling back to talking about working with the DJs, is oftentimes I try to give them a skeleton of like either there's a couple ways, right? Sometimes I'll give them like you know six the six records that I think work, and I'm saying like it doesn't have to be these six re- six records, but it needs to feel like this, right? Because I want the DJ to have autonomy to create, especially if I'm going to a different city they have a better finger on the pulse of what's happening versus me. And so like, and I want, like, I want creators to be creatives, right? Like, if you're good at this, you are a DJ, you pick music. So my job isn't to pick music for you. My job is to like, give you a direction and let you go create. And then out of that, we create something that's better than the parts, right? right. So it's, it's always fun to see what DJs come up with, what records they end up picking the feeling that they get. And sometimes I'll even describe a wine. So I'll say, oh, I don't have anything for this, like for this wine, it's blank, right? Um, And then I'll say, look, I'm gonna talk to you about the wine. I'm gonna break the wine down for you. And then you go find the record that that, that you feel. And so I think some of those are the most fun and interesting. And it's like, it's a great surprise to see when they come back and they say, oh, this is the record I found, this is the record I picked. Um, Cause like, their records always hit. <laughs> it's it's yeah. funny, and it, it always feels good. It feels right when we do that. So, do you get what are the events looking like? I know you guys are going to Stanford. Are you guys yeah. coming to Chicago anytime soon? So, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna work on that. Yeah. So, the funny thing is, so we we've done like two shows, four seatings in Chicago, like in the last year. Well, five really. Five in Chicago in the last year, and people always ask when are you coming back to Chicago, and the reason why is like. The we people really love it. People really love the concept, and the people always see that we're away, and they're like, "You're never gonna be here." And it's like it's it's hard because like Chicago's home, and in theory we could do it probably like we could do it once a month, but I don't want to get burnt out on doing it once right. a month here in Chicago. So we try to we try to like book the dates and make them big enough to where they feel right. Um, so we we're, we're gonna we want to do Chicago here soon um i want to say january 2020 end of january we might do a friends and family one that's an exclusive yeah, yeah. Friends john and, and i would love to come to either yeah, the friends, we friends and family yeah. or where, where are we at with that or, yeah. or, <laughs> we can get you on the friends and family yeah, we, can, or, we can make friends and family happen for sure or, or the event we'd yeah. love to come to it yeah so so it's just it's trying to figure out the logistics of making the chicago one work because it's funny like that one is you would think that would be the easiest one but it's it's actually more difficult in a lot of ways because of like the amount of support and love that we get and the fact that like we could do probably 10 seatings. <laughs> yeah, <that's awesome. laughs> so it's a lot of fun. We try to keep it intimate. Like I want to keep them intimate um, when we do Chicago because that, that's the thing that where I can touch everybody. And I feel, like I want people to get that from me. Um, so we're figuring it out we're working on it did you guys do nashville eventually yeah we did do nashville um home was really dope it was probably the most diverse and versatile crowd <laughs> it was so weird i was like this is i it was it was nothing like i expected it was nothing like mo expected um it was really really it was i was like whoa this is different like when people walking in i was like yo this is okay here we go <laughs> well, that's, so i was in nashville three months ago and I hadn't been for a few years. And every time I've ever gone to Nashville, I have more fun than I have anywhere else. And I genuinely feel like when people are in Nashville, they're just trying to have a good time. And I went with two of my best friends and I said, look around. There's virtually every demographic and kids from, look like they're there with fake IDs, <laughs> all the way to people who look like they're about 80 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And everything in between, yeah. all partying and having a good time together. And 
I was like, you don't get that anywhere else no, you go. So weird. It was, um, and it was the same in every bar. So yeah. whether you were at a smaller bar, or you went to like honky tonks or any of the big bars, it was the same. It was everybody from we'll say twenty one because yeah. they got it <laughs> to eighty, and every demographic yeah, it's... just having a blast. And I think too, like for for me, I think that's why like I love the Nashville music scene so much is like you literally get to test out your your records your music on everybody like you know and yeah. like on broadway at the end of broadway like the person playing at the end of broadway who's playing at 2 a.m is probably phenomenal right yeah. like and the opener on broadway like at you know 3 30 in the afternoon is probably phenomenal yeah. right and it's and it's so great to see that like you got to be you got to be really dope just to make it but there's so much great talent there and from so many different genres like you know like Jack White likes to hang out in Nashville like nobody thinks of, like everybody thinks of country when they think about Nashville but it's it is rock it is alternative it's soul music yeah it is like gospel's really big there it, so like all of these sounds live in this one place um so it's always great to go back. It's so much fun going back to Nashville. It's very fun and very stressful because I just want to see everybody and everything. Yeah. So that's the only thing that makes it tough, but oh, I love it. I the love pressure's it. on for you. Yeah. But I said that to somebody recently. I, I love country music, but somebody was like, oh, well, it's all country. And I'm like, no. If you go there, whether it's 3.30 or it's 2 a.m., there is a wide variety of music 100%. being played. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it was almost less country music than I was hoping for <laughs> <laughs> being a fan of country music, yeah. but you got to hear everything, yeah. which is 100%. which is very, very cool. What's the next event after Stanford? Um, so so I think what we're going to do is because, so when you, the, how can I break this down? It's a long, no, I can, I can make it simple. So what happens is is having these two entities, these two businesses, having samples and samples, and then having a wine shop, finding out those schedules is really tough um, because they conflict. So November, December, or October, November, December are really, really busy for us at the wine shop. So what we're doing is we use that time to like cherry pick if we're going to do stuff. We do more private events during, the, during that time with the samples and samples front because I'm at the wine shop like crazy hours just trying to make sure that we do what we call it we call it O N D october november december for the holidays. holidays and so then what we'll do is we'll ramp up with the samples and sample stuff top of the new year yeah. because that's a different market that mm -hmm. we're targeting so it's it's about finding balance so right now we're, we're kind of in the planning stages for 2020 yeah. i don't know so yeah Planning out a new tour. Yeah, in cool. So. You'll have to let us know. We will share the tour on 100%. 100%. Um, John was asking me a question from the corner over there, but you, you bump and set it, and John just about <laughs> set the ball to me so I can spike this question. Um, holiday pairings. So I said before we came on air, I'd, I'd ask for some advice, and it's a loaded question because, like we said, you'd say try a bunch of different things. Are there certain pairings that you recommend at different price points for let's say Thanksgiving because you're doing a turkey, mm -hmm. if you're doing a ham. Is there any recommendations, or any basic ones yeah. you could give so us? I'm gonna, so I'm not going to talk about brands. I'm going to talk about style. Perfect. Um, and, and the reason why I like talking style in general versus brand, even more so than talking about region or location sometimes, is it gives you the opportunity to like be able to try a lot of different things. Because if I just say, like if I just say um, drink, like, song a song for a song right then you may not have access everyone doesn't have access to that so but if i tell you oh drink earthy weighty with reds with a little bit of fruit then that's a style that you can take anywhere right, right. so i'm setting the foundation so for me right now it's rose and i like really there's kind of two types of rose i like during the fall winter months the one is like this kind of like bright, minerally, super high tone acid white or rose that's almost like kind of salmon colored. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Wild caught salmon colored. Yeah. <laughs> but I know that's very specific. But that that has acidity where it cuts through the fat, right? So like if you're having like a turkey, 
Like the great thing about that is if the turkey is really well made, it has that fattiness, that juiciness, so it can cut through the fat of that. But if the turkey is super dry, it makes adds mouth watering notes, so it can help moisten that turkey. <laughs> so like I like really high tone, so bright, crisp, minerally dry rosés, um, or you can go like the super rich, creamy, super dark dense rosés because then those wines have a little bit more weight a little more heft i'm not a big if i'm going to drink red wine during the holidays i want it actually lower in alcohol and a little bit on the lighter side because we're okay. all eating a lot yeah. you're eating a lot heavy you're already. getting it's heavy already i don't want to add weight to weight like i don't like i'm going to be sleepy enough <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i don't want wines that are going to be really big and, and knock you out so i like those so i, I like to go Rosé doing, like, I'm drinking a ton of rosé in the fall and winter through, throughout December. I love it. Like, that's, that's a lot of fun. And I think rosé as a category is, like, we think we hear rosé all day. Um, I was going to hashtag that. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. And I'm, I'm a guy like, rosé all year. So, like, that's what's fun. And it's funny, even at our wine shop, like, we pare it down. Like, we pare down our rosé section a lot, right, from the summer just because people don't want it as much. But... What we do is we use that pairing down to pick out the ones we really love. Yeah. And then, then those become the drivers for our rosé section. So our rosé section probably shrinks, I would say, from you know, 30, 40 skews to probably like 10, 15. Wow, okay. Um, so if actually, I came into 1340 now, I'd get some of your favorites. Yeah, you're going to see the ones I really love. I think now we may be, we may be at 10, 10, if not less, skews Very of cool. rosé. I'm a big rosé fan. But those ten skews, fire, right? Like awesome. those are the, those are the ten that made it, right? That that yeah. we're like, okay, this is the thing that people bought a lot of, and this is the thing like we're digging out on right now. So okay, so whether you're good at cooking turkey like me, or in my <laughs> friends watching, Sean's the worst turkey cooker <laughs> in the world. Rose. Um, if it's you, Sean, well, you still do rosé, you'll be <laughs> yeah. fine. And, and then, dr yeah. dry turkey he made last year. <laughs> And, and the great thing is if you bring it, right, like, it's like, look, I don't know if, the, like, if you don't know if the food's going to be good or not, and you're bringing it to a friend. At least your rosé is good. You know, the rosé is good, and it's going to make it. whatever you eat taste better. Perfect. <laughs> so, Sean, if you, do, if you do your dry turkey again this year, I'll bring rosé. So, he yeah. made it one year and said, uh, I made it so bad that I would never be asked to make Thanksgiving turkey again. <laughs> well played. Yeah, well played. Just, he's like, I had to do it poorly one time. Well played. That's uh, a smart move, actually. Yeah. Right. I use a green egg for mine, so I do this oh, whole yeah. procedure on mine. And I love my turkey, but I'm going to do rosé yeah. with it this year. You like the green egg? Love the green oh, egg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I even have a big one and a mini one now. Because wow. you can only really cook one thing on the egg at once. Right, yeah. Yeah. So my dad, for uh, his birthday, wanted uh, ribs, but he also wanted lamb. And I was like, well, I can't really do, both can't things, smoke two yeah. things. I mean, I have a gas grill, but um, I can't do both. So I went to the, there's this place, and it's a shout out to them, the Backyard Barbecue Shop. Yeah, okay. Sounds um, in Off of Green Bay Road. They got a lot of, like, really cool um, rubs and spices that you just can't find in stores. Mm -hmm. It's all this, like, um, mom and pop rubs and spices. Nice. And um, I was like, I need a little one. So I got a little mini egg, and then I got the actual large yeah. egg. So I, a little off topic. Are you, when you talk about, like, barbecue in general, are you mm -hmm. a dry rub or are you a sauce guy? I'm mm. typically a dry rub guy. Yeah. So I'm a dry rub guy if I'm doing, like, uh, ribs. Yeah. But uh, I'm a dry rub person with my turkey, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big dry rub guy. Well, so. Yeah. When you talk about like Memphis barbecue, right? It's dry rub. Dry rub. Right? It's dry rub. So I'm a big dry rub guy, and I say this as a pescatarian, but right. I wasn't always a pescatarian. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, definitely a dry rub guy. Yeah. When I go home, that's the only place. Like when I go back to Nashville or or West Tennessee, like that's the only time of year where I'll be like, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna eat everything. Right. You gotta try it. All. <laughs> you gotta try it all because it's home, man. I can't help myself. Mo, do you have any uh, preferences on wines? Like, have you? B being his partner, have you found something that you love, or are you now the I'm gonna try everything too? I never um, asked that question. Yeah, That's he, a good one. you know what wine I like. Oh yeah, yeah. I know a couple. There's a there's a grape out of Austria. Um, Zygo, right? Yeah, yeah that's like uh, yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah, um, he really it, funky, like earthy notes on that one. <laughs> Light on the palate. Got though, the verbiage you know? now. Look at, you know. look at look at him. Him. So proud. It's like it's like <laughs> when you turn sixteen, if like your friends got a Ferrari dealer and he's just gonna let you keep driving Ferrari, <laughs> you're gonna. I'm just gonna <laughs> crank it out. <laughs> already. Yeah. Look at him. Uh, so yeah, that's Flat. that's one, and then. 
there was this interesting sparkling that we had from oh, the, the quiche. Was that the from the Ukrainian? Yeah. Yeah. Armenian. Armenian. Armenia. It's Armenian sparkling. No, I'm talking about the Ukrainian people that we hung oh, out with. Oh yeah, when we were in Bordeaux. Yeah. Oh, what was it called? Oh, I can't. Remember. I can see the label now. It was fire. Too. Yeah, there. Yeah, like, it was amazing. Like I gave some of that to my girlfriend's dad yeah, for his birthday. Uh, it was so fire. We. I ran into them because I was. <laughs> I, I got lost. I was trying to figure out how to get to the hotel. <laughs> and he did a respond. And I also just didn't have Wi Fi. So yeah, was... And you were drinking wine all day. <laughs> well, I ran into them. In the and they were, yeah, at the airport. And Bordeaux Airport is like very small, like it's tiny. It's tiny. Um, and they were like, do you know how to get there? And like, we're in France, so most people don't speak English. So I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> And they're like, oh, I think the bus is coming. I was like, cool, let's take the bus. And then Derek finally messaged me. So we got on the bus and they're like, hey, make sure to stop by our booth. Like, we'll take care of you because, you know, we went through this struggle together. And I was like, cool. And then Derek and I went there and I was like, look, you know, we kind of have to go there. Yeah. You know, I don't know. How I, I don't know how it's going to taste because I know you're very <laughs> peculiar. You know, you, you know, you're specific with the wines. And we went there and it was like amazing. And yeah. then we came back. <laughs> And then they okay. sent us home with like four bottles yeah, each. Yeah, That's was, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was they right under the limit to where people would start looking at you crazy. Yeah. They sent us with that many bottles. We like, yeah. I still have a couple of little sparklings to it. Just, uh, oh, you do? Was oh, it art? 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 Oh. Art of wine. Art of wine, I yeah. think is what it is. It and is they had fun. some good branding. Yeah, too. they had some good branding. Yeah. And I don't, they're not here in the States yet, are they? No. Yeah. We have to reach back yeah. out to them. So that's a. It's funny. We, I guess we, we we can talk about our potential other business. We want to start getting into a little bit more of helping brands get to the states, um, and that's kind of the reason why we were in Bordeaux for a number of reasons. But like that's one of the things that like we found like there's kind of a niche is like ha- helping brands find the right distributors here in the states, uh, right importers and distributors here in the states, and like starting in Chicago, of course, because what I've come to find out is. Like the process for making wine in another country and then getting it imported and then it finding the right home is a very treacherous and difficult process. And what happens is you can have really great juice, you can make a really great wine, but if you're with the wrong distributor, and like you could be with a great distributor, but they're just, they you have two different identities. You could be at the wrong distributor and you get lost or you won't sell as much. So what I've realized is like, yo, as sommeliers and as wine buyers, we always, when we think of certain distributors, we think of them, we, you know, have them as, this is the natural wine distributor. This is a distributor who's gonna got a really great book, it's really big, and they have everything. This is a distributor who focuses on Central Eastern European wine. So, and so when we're buying, we're buying based on, like, who has what. And so finding the right home for a producer is as important as them making really great wine because, you know, if if no one hears about it, no one ever tastes True. it, then does it, does it exist, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's one of the things that we've been, like, working on slowly. Like, it's been a really long process. And because we have, like, you know, a million balls in the air right now, it's one of those things where, like, we, we chip away at it. But eventually I think that's something I'm answering a question that you probably haven't asked yet or probably wasn't even thinking about asking. Is like that's kind of what's on the horizon for us is, like, getting more into that space as well. And then getting into the talking space as well. So. That's very cool because, yeah, I guess a producer sitting somewhere else in the world would have no transparency into where exactly they should be here. Right. And the amount of time, money, and effort and product wasted going into the wrong hands yeah, is crazy. Is, I mean, yeah. you're, uh, it's, uh, you kind of reminded me of a quote that kind of fits, kind of doesn't fit. I was reading a marketing article once and it said, you know, if you're not marketing yourself right, it's like your company's winking at a girl in the dark. You know what you're doing, but nobody else does. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's no, good. So, and that's real good. I like that. You know, so, uh, yeah, they have this great product, but nobody else really knows about the product. You know, they got, they're doing what they're doing, but nobody else gets, uh, gets a hold of it. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's a great idea. And there's plenty, like, when we were in Bordeaux, there's plenty of stories of, you know, small family-owned vineyards and them just trying to figure out how to get into the American market and understand 
um, what we're drinking over here and yeah, why sure. we're interested in that. So yeah, because yeah, it's and you both of you now have such a great grasp on the cultural differences from different markets too, because how does somebody from Central Europe or Eastern Europe or anywhere across the world that doesn't have exposure to these markets have any idea? And you can't just up and come and travel the U.S. Yeah. whenever you want. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. immigration steps <laughs> yeah, you got to take. It's, tough. it's really tough yeah. to do. So w what a cool value add yeah. to, to the industry 100%. for you guys. And and like and samples and samples is a great vehicle for us to kind of figure out like what each city, each town mm -hmm. is into, right? And we, you know, we're in major markets and we're in like even B wine markets as well. So it's really great to see like that is where I probably I really love to travel in that spaces and talking to the people to find out where they are, what they're into, and like it's funny how like finding out what people's taste in music and their taste in wine like it's a lot of like data, you know what I mean? And, it, and not data in like clicks, but data in like downloading and getting a feel for what people like and enjoy and a feel for what the market is, is, is a lot of fun. And meeting all these new people and faces is great. So yeah, you guys are a wealth of knowledge. Like you said, just not just on wine, but now on different locations, consumers, uh, uh, taste palette, you know, what makes them yeah. excited and, yeah. you know, happy, you know, what, what resonates, like you guys said, even the music, it, varies from what you do probably in Atlanta is different than from Chicago and yeah. very different from Stanford, I'm guessing yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll figure that yeah. one out. Like, I'm really excited about Stanford because like I think this is probably going to be the young, on average, the youngest demographic we deal with. Yeah. You know, like everybody's there is probably 25 and under. Right? Love rosé. <laughs> right? And we like and we're doing we're doing a rosé from Austria, so I'm really excited to see how that goes over. And like. Um, so that's gonna be fun because that's gonna be it's a really a new new market for us as far as like we've done some stuff on the west coast like because I, I have friends who live out there but this is our first like this is probably our largest samples and samples that yeah. we've ever done and it's also um going to be a new demographic yeah right because most people who come to my events have disposable income right. right a lot of disposable income and i imagine like you know stanford kids probably do a yeah. fair amount yeah. but allowances are high <laughs> yeah allowances are high stanford. but like there's not many you know 22 23 year olds coming to samples and samples right. just because like it's an it's a new avenue and you know so it's going to be fun to see what happens with with those kids so. yeah congratulations i'm excited to hear about what happens and obviously you're adding a third element of art now too yeah, so yeah, that yeah. that kind of shifts things a little bit yeah. more as well it's gonna be Very a lot cool. of fun at least they're really smart kids there at stanford <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they are smart yeah, they so. gotta be smart to get yeah. in there yeah it's funny so like um it's i have so the high school i went to was math science and engineering high school math health sciences and engineering so it's it, like the kids i know the stanford kids yeah. <laughs> like, i know that like i, That's I remember that exactly you know? <laughs> i remember those kids like i know those kids and so it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be fun to see like what those kids are now too because you know yeah i'm i'm gonna be 10 years older than some of those kids yeah, yeah. So. and what's crazy is like they were pushing for that event right yeah. so Very the cool. guy so um one of the the gentlemen who was pushing for the event actually was at samples and samples in nashville yeah and he came up to us he was like oh i do like student engagement at stanford like i think this would be really cool for the kids and then he passed it off to the students and they had to push for it and literally i was working on this for like two and a half weeks kind of going back and forth with them and then last what wednesday yeah. is when i called you i was like they want us to come next week. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, oh, all right, let me put this together. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, so it'll be exciting yeah, and it's it's something dope. new for us to yeah. like explore. Your management and production v wheels were like spinning. All <laughs> oh, yeah. time. They're spinning right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think too, it's funny in the, the way like our relationship works is like, once it's booked and everything's like in place, like Mo's like, ah, I feel relieved. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Shit. <laughs> right. My turn. <laughs> like my job is done. We talked about this last night. I was like, yeah, my job is just about done. Yeah, and I'm like, now I'm now I'm starting to get stressed. Like, like building the list. Like it doesn't feel real to me. Uh, as we're talking about, it, it feels real. Like as we get closer, but like it won't feel real until like I'm on the way to like on the way to the airport. And then like then it starts like it starts to like rise, and it's like okay, okay, okay. And then right before the event, I'm like. 
they may hate it. Yeah. <laughs> but then after like the first or second wine, it's like, okay. No, it's they're, like they're young kids like, drinking. They're not going to hate yeah, it. Yeah, I know. It's the, it's, they're going to love it. Yeah, it's, a, it's the irrational part of me. I, I understand Oh, that. yeah, it's your but, it's your baby. So yeah, that, you're like, oh, man. Like, it's understandable. Yeah, like last night, like the wine's picked, right? And there's no going back. But last night I was like, I don't know. I, like, are these wines good? I was like, I know these wines. I, I know that they're good, but I'm yeah. still like... I don't know if they're good though. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if this music's good. It's like this music. If you ever good. need somebody to sample it, call John <laughs> and I. We'll come let you know if it's good or not good. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Mo, do you have any events coming up outside of uh, samples and samples? Um, Anything cool coming up? Yeah. So I do this uh, event series. So I do two event series. So one is um, called Culture Cuisine. So I think we'll be doing like a smaller version of that um, coming up in either Dece- late de- or early December or um, early January, and that I work with a with a travel agent, um, but he creates cultural experiences for a lot of his customers, and we take that same idea and create cultural experiences through food and spirits and wine. So we'll always bring in a chef. So the last one we did was. Japan, and then the one before that was Argentina, and then the first one was Italy. And shout out to Derek for curating the wine list on the one for Argentina That's and uh, and Italy. And then I do another concept out in New York. Um, we've been doing that for like roughly eighteen months. Is live from dinner, um, and we have three of those coming up. So that is a six course dinner meal, a dinner menu that we curate based off of who those artists are. So we'll find up-and-coming musicians so we'll have an opener and a closer first two courses will be based off of like early childhood memories um and then the next four will be based off of the headliner so yeah. you are one creative dude Try. um how does somebody get a hold of you if they want you either on the management or event side yeah you can uh email us or just go to our website um www.demevents.com and just or email us at info at demevents.com and we'll be able to help you out. You two are way more creative than I am. Is this the, you guys uh, are just creative guys, which is <laughs> awesome. And it's great that you guys met one another and thankfully you finally met him instead of just ignoring, <laughs> instead ignoring of his message, instead of yeah, ghosting his messages because um, I can just tell you guys are going to A, kill it in Stanford, you're going to kill it with samples and samples. And I do foresee a lot of collaboration with you guys because uh, I do a fair amount of business coaching, and I see this all the time where um, people are not the right partners for each other. Yeah. They just don't have the right um, yin and yang, and you guys really do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an, a yeah. cool thing to watch. And it's like I think he's the brother I wish I never had, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so like I think we're, like, we're, we're both only children. Yeah. And so the cool thing about that is like, like we've kind of built that camaraderie around each other. Um, and being able to share in that way. And I think like the friends, like the mutual friends we have are really dope. Um, and it's, it's good. Like it's like, that's the thing that keeps us where we are. Like, and we, we I think, I think we both don't really take it seriously yet. Like it's now, yeah. it still feels like, it's like a game. It's yeah. It's like, yeah. like we're playing drinking and listening to music. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, so like, bad. like, yeah, let's see what we can do. Like, it's like, I mean, we did this. Let's go try something else. Like, right. let's go, like, what else can we do? Like, if we did this, then we can do it. So, like, that's why I said, like, the accomplishments, like, that you listed off are really, like, it feels weird in, in a way because it, it's just us doing what's next. It's just yeah. us, like, saying, like. Keeping it moving. Yeah. Like, we don't really even notice, like, what we're doing, I don't think, either. Because yeah. we're so in it, and it's always good for us to step back. Like, I don't think. Like Stanford, we didn't yeah, even really nah, like. We yeah. thought about it, but it hasn't yeah. really hit. It's, I'm telling you, if it wasn't on Friday and you guys needed a hype <laughs> to introduce you, just yo, give me yo, a shout. Yep. I will come down to Stanford, drink some wine, listen to some music, and introduce you. Yeah, <laughs> please do, because that list of accomplishments is. I was like, well, you did all those. I know, things. I know yeah. it's awesome. I, but like, I don't like. This is probably the first time. So I'm I'm getting into it a little bit, but this is probably the first time like I've heard all those things. Yeah. Like this is literally the first time. I, like I know, like yes, I remember them. I did them, but like hearing them all, is like that's surreal. It's cool to reflect on that. One of my favorite quotes. It's Bill Gates's quote, and Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins uses it a lot. Is 
we always overestimate what we can achieve in a year and underestimate what we can achieve in a decade. And you're there, you know, like you're, yeah. you're getting to that point that in 10 years you've achieved so much, yeah. you know, everybody thinks, Oh my God, in one year I'm going to be there. And it's like, you've kicked ass for 10 years. Yeah. So it's, it's awesome yeah. to see you've done all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Very, very cool. Before I let you guys go, cause we b blew through an hour. We're, we're moving <laughs> on an hour and a half here. Um, and I want to be respectful of your times. I always ask this, of every guest, and I've asked this of you before, but I'm sure you're gonna have a different answer than last time. Give us a piece of advice for somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't have to be in the wine space because yeah. I don't think that's as easy of a space to get into as uh, as just yeah. general entrepreneurship. Um, I, so like, I, I thought about this question, and I think like the first answer that I thought about was like, run towards failure, right? Like, like get don't get comfortable with failure, but get familiar with that feeling. Um, the other thing that I think, and I, I think I'm in a different space than when like I wrote that answer, and then like in this moment, and for me like it's, I want to take a couple seconds to think about this, sure. um, but for me, the way I'm feeling and the and the way the work has gone has taught me to just be super thankful of all the things that are around you, and if you continue to be thankful for where you're at in this journey and the struggle and the hard parts and like really sit in that and be mindful, like that's the thing that propels you. Like we always think about like there's a, there's no, you know, pill, there's no blue pill. There's no like one thing that's gonna get you there, but it is taking care and being mindful and being present every day that helps you, you know, like chop the wood right like it's yeah. the thing that helps you get to that point and i know i mixed like 18 metaphors no 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 that was fantastic <laughs> um yeah we i was saying this to somebody recently i said you know we've done this show now i think this is episode 72 or three john will correct me in a second um but i've had so many different pieces of advice from people and that's one that i will listen back to again uh great piece of advice and you're right you know it's a lot of good advice on um, a, everybody is going to fail, and B, be appreciative and thankful yeah. of the journey. I think a lot of people don't stop and appreciate the journey itself 100%. because they're in this space where being an entrepreneur, we can be honest, is stressful from time to time. You yeah. don't know you know, when the next paycheck is going to come. You don't know if a business is going to succeed. You don't know if an event's going to succeed, like yeah. you said. You, know, you, you have nerves going into every event because this is something that is your entire life, but being able to stop and appreciate the journey is super yeah. important. Fantastic advice too. Yeah. And then, I mean, having uh, one last thing, I'm taking all. No, go. I'll, no, I'll, go. I'll, look, this is and, this is the nature of wheelhouse <laughs> is to help entrepreneurs out. So I love it. So and I think too, like making sure like the people around you, like right, like the reason, like the reason I'm sitting in this chair today, like is like there are two people who I can directly relate that to. That is like the work I've done with Mo, right, and then like in a very, very tangible way, like Regine, right? Yeah. Regine Russo, like mm -hmm. she brought me in here, you know, almost a year ago, was yeah. it? Yeah, it was. She brought me in here as a, you know, with her and just to help me to start to get me on the process of like doing interviews and talking and being in that space because I expressed that I was interested. So like it's that team, like, and I'm eternally grateful to, you know, everyone who, who works with me, like Steve Smith, everyone around. But I'm not here by myself, right? I'm not on the cover by myself. Like, this is not a me, it's a we thing. And that, you know, Regine and Mo are like really great examples of actually talking on this mic right now of why I'm here. So I think that's the, that's the other thing is the team is everything, you know? So important. Yeah. Shout out to Regine, too. She's such a blast. Yeah. She <laughs> she taught me a whole lot about wine. And she watches the show. She likes and comments from time to time. So shout out to her. I'm sure she's going to watch oh, this yeah, one. Definitely. And I'm sure she's incredibly proud of how far you've come in one year. And I think it has been almost exactly a year yeah, because crazy. we were around the same fall time period last year when you were on. And it's awesome to see how, from my standpoint, I'm sure I'm speaking for John too, how far you've come. I mean, yeah. innovate, becoming a partner in a literal wine store business and then samples and samples taken off with you and Mo. How, how cool is that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of people don't cover that amount of ground in years. You've covered it in a yeah. year. So you yeah. should be proud of all those actors. <laughs> <laughs> and Mo, how about you? I'm sure you've come across a ton of entrepreneurs and you've coached a ton of them and you've helped manage a lot of them. Give us some advice. Yeah, I think for me, it's always like faith, like 
believing in what others never saw, right? Um, and that's what my job is, to believe in someone's vision and see what they're not seeing or see what everyone else is not seeing, right? Um, when you think of samples and samples, uh, to me, samples and samples like my <laughs> the least successful event that we did, right? Um, at the time, right? And now to see that it's taken us to these extreme heights and abilities to even work with Derek, um, it's very humbling, but it's also one of the things that people would have never said, oh yeah, you should do this, like this specific event. So I always try to keep my circle very small and um, always listen to, you know, whatever God is really trying to say to me and, and move in that direction, right? So even thinking of like my internship building, that's like a huge part of my business now. And interns are looked at as like something that most people don't really care too much about. They're just like, I'll do this busy work and help us get that. But um, for me, it, it stems to like building Derek's brand, but also building up interns' brands, if, if you may say, right? Um, building up what they really want to accomplish in their life um, and show them the vehicles where those possibilities are, are open for them as well. Well, you're a super creative guy, and I can tell that you live on the motto of giver's gain. And I'm sure not just you, Derek, but all the interns and everybody you come across are very, very lucky to yeah. be working with you. 100%. And, and, uh, and that skill set that you have to be able to pull someone's vision out of them and pull someone's story out, I said it earlier, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, I, I, I wish I had one-tenth of that skill set that you have because I do a lot of coaching and training of, of business owners and I, I've tried to become better at doing that. But... That is a true skill set that you have that not a lot of people possess. Even when you try to possess it, it's not easy to have. So. Yeah, and I would say, like, for me, like, and this is the last thing, but, like, YouTube was huge for me, right? So I would be at my desk, and I would get in trouble for it all the time at work, but I literally listened to, like, three interviews every single day figuring out how other people got to that point, right? So when I saw, like, those things coming, my direction where it's like, oh, we don't have the money to do this event. Well, let's find a way to do it rather than giving up, right? Like learning all of these things or like going into debt, like listening to Airbnb story of like getting 10 different credit cards and going into debt and really believing in what they wanted to do was huge for me. And even like Kevin Hart, same similar situation. We're going into debt, like writing these false checks to like get to <laughs> wherever he needs to be, like not scamming people for that, uh, but just really believing in it so much that that's the only thing that you're going to be doing. Because like for us to explain to especially like to our families, where especially black families, right? Like my family doesn't know anything that I do, right? They're like, yeah, I think he just does these things. And like, I'll be on trips with them, and they're like, how did you get here? I said, oh, I'm working on a client thing. They're like, oh, sure you are. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like truly believing in yourself um, when others don't. Yeah. Like, and I think for me, like, my my parents didn't, <clears throat> especially, like, my pops, like, he's super, like, he, like, he basically created his own way, right? Like, like, people talk about, like, you know, walking two miles to school. He did it, <laughs> right? Like, he did it. And he didn't understand he didn't understand what I was doing or what a Somali was. And he was like, he was concerned and nervous about it. And once I got the cover, he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, it took that. Like, and, and like, people are going to say, wow, like, that sucks. But it's like, no, like, that is, like, that has been instilled in us, I think, both to, like, oh, you got to go do this and get this thing. And our parents are proud and surprise and unsure right and that, and that's the thing about being an adult now like i think about that with with like having children um because i don't have any but thinking about like where my parents are and the things that they go through and and the understanding they have is like all you want your kids to do is be okay yeah and entrepreneurship is the one thing that you don't really want to wish on your kids because it is the little long route is the it is the longest way around to get to success, right? But and the most uncertain way, yeah. yeah. Like it, and so like, it, like it's the, the one thing. Like I think about this, I was like, oh, I see why. Like my parents, were, like were nervous and concerned because, you know, they weren't entrepreneurs, but they under they like I, there are adults and friends who I saw that were entrepreneurs, and they saw it, and they saw what it took, and they saw the work and the pain. And so it's it's really fun to see them like 
be proud of that. Be proud of what we're doing, both our parents. And yeah, so it's, it's just really dope. It's just really dope. So and and looking like us, like you're not not run, running from the idea of like you got. These are two black kids in wine. <laughs> like that's not that's not the aesthetic that you normally see, and it's not something that I'm gonna run from either. Um, and I think that like that's dope. That like that adds to the story. But if I can do this and I can like and I can move in this space, and you know, it's no telling what can happen. So. Well, I'm. This is a certainty. It's not just a presumption. I am sure that you two are both very big inspirations for a lot of people. And your parents have a lot of reasons to be very proud of you guys. But I'm sure everybody from your interns to everybody that you're working with and even the kids at Stanford and everybody else, you guys are definitely going to be very inspirational to them. Yeah, for sure. So, they, I mean, like I said, we, I, you, you're going to be our first maybe third time guest. We've had a, lot, <laughs> we've had a couple seconds. <laughs> right. But I think we might have right. to do this every year around the holidays, A, because we do get to drink wine with yeah. them. But <laughs> I'm, I'm presuming that in a year's time you will have like two, three different more successful ventures. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. samples and samples will be killing it. And we should right, definitely so, yeah. do this again. This is yeah, it's fun every time, and I, it's funny like I I forget just how much fun it is, and then as soon as we like as soon as I walked in the door and sat down, I was like, oh yeah, this is this is gonna be a good one. You're only getting <laughs> you're only getting five emails from me this time. <laughs> yeah, after right, that, yeah. I'm giving up. Oh yeah, I was yeah, it was. Well, you can't I feel bad now. He ignored Mo's uh, text yeah, messages was, too. You know, I actually, on the, on one of the emails, I finally in bold print. Please respond. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> he's like, oh, okay. He was right back to me. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I actually saw that one, and I called, I called Derek. On <laughs> like, that are you going to say, hey, are like, you working on this? Like, like, Yo, no. Is what you remember? You remember when I uh, ghosted you, Mo? And that, that, that was that. That was that conversation. Like, you remember when I ghosted you, Mo? Uh, it just happened again. I think, I, think, uh, I think we figured this out. We have to reach out to Mo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, yeah. no. He now it like is the guy. that Mo is a. I, I I know where I'm good at and where I'm terrible at, and especially during that time because we met right around. Um, we met again during that event. Oh yeah, yeah. Over at uh, the Drake. The, the Drake. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, and when it happened, I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity, and this is the worst time. <laughs> 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 like, this, this is literally the worst. I would time. love to do it, but it's a terrible time. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is the worst time. Right. And so, but it worked out, and I'm. I appreciate you uh, texting and emailing, calling, like all of that. It worked. It John is the best yeah. at he, he's following beast. up. Yeah, so. that's the key. I, Nobody is a yeah. better follow upper. <laughs> yeah, than no. John. And he, when I there's a guest that I want, I'm like a dog with a bone. Yeah. I'm just you. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you so no, much. No, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you guys for coming on. We're definitely going to make this a regular thing, but we will definitely reach out to Mo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We'll make yes. it Mo's second, your third. <laughs> yes, and yes. Good luck at Stanford. Not that you guys need it. I'm sure it's going to be a blast. Well, I'm thank excited you. Oh, to yeah. hear about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for this very delicious wine. This is awesome. Hey. I uh, will have to come by 1340 and uh, hang out, Yeah. take some definitely. wine classes, and... Drink a bunch of your wine, yeah, and get some rosé for the holidays. I do have one quick yeah. one uh, before you get out of here. Uh, as far as thirteen forty, two actually two quick ones. Uh, gift cards. So yeah, so we do have gift cards for okay. sure. Um, so people can just come in. Come denominations. in, ask for yeah, it, any denomination. Um, I mean, don't ask for a dollar gift card. Well, of but, course, yeah. <laughs> but ask for the thousand dollar gift card. Yeah, thousand dollars we can make happen too. Yeah, but yeah, Boom. but yeah, any denomination. Okay, very good, and then. When I was there, uh, super sharp place. Really like it. Thank you. Uh, private events. Yeah, so we do do private events. Um, so with those private events, like if you want to buy out the space, you can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. We also have an upstairs and a downstairs. Yeah, very so cool. So you can, if you email us, uh, you can email me. I'm I'm a little bit more responsive to the 1340 email than I am the other <laughs> one. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you just, you can do uh, Derek at, one three four zero bws dot com okay. or Cody C O D Y at one three four zero bws dot com. That's my business partner. My okay. money's on Cody. I would email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I uh, I got a question about that. Yeah. John just kind of reminded me of something. If somebody wants to set up kind of a private event around the holidays, like a company holiday party, can they rent yeah. out the space and then can they get food catered in? Yeah. So it, we we're BYOF, so you can bring your own food, or we can do the catering for you if Very you cool. like. 
um, to like you know companies like we've had uh, Deloitte, Accenture, uh, those companies have come in and used our space and done tastings and classes. So, uh, big or small, we do everything. Awesome. Yeah, we've been actually, and it's been for a while now, but uh, we've been looking to do uh, some sort of a, a private event primarily just for guests that we've had here. Yeah. We've had so many people give us time and great advice and thought it'd be cool to have everybody kind of come together and network. Yeah. Uh, and your place, when I walked in, I was, and I, I know we're on the air, but I really was. I was like, damn, this is cool. It's really sharp. <laughs> yeah, so, I love it. It's, yeah. it's a great place to like walk into every day. Um, also, I do want to say, uh, pardon me, I do want to, um, I'm going to do a little soliciting. Oh, uh, go yeah. for it. But <laughs> so uh, so I coach for a little league called the Near West Little League. And November 20th is our fundraiser. They're doing it at, at, at my wine shop. So if you want to, like, if you want to pay it for it, um, donate to shoot me an email, ask questions about the Near West Little League because I love coaching Little League baseball. It's probably – I always tell people I'm a little league baseball coach first. Like, say, so what do you do? I say, I'm a little league baseball coach. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows a little bit about why? Right? But it's totally different. Um, so yeah. So if if like, you know, if you want to support something that's a really great cause, uh, Near West Little League, you can come on November 20th or not, but donate, check it okay. out. Okay. Yeah. Is cool. the uh, info on the 1340 BWS? It'll it'll be on the website. Um, Here it is. All right. So it's actually going up. Coda's gonna shoot me, but it's gonna it's actually supposed to go up on the calendar uh, today, today, tomorrow. Okay. Um, so you'll see it on the calendar. But if you're following me on Instagram or any social, if you're following the wine shop, you'll mm -hmm. see it. But yeah. So. Well, count count me in for a donation. We oh, yeah. John and I, a uh, big part of what we do with Wheelhouse is we want to give back to charity. So count me in. Yeah. As 100%. soon as it's up, I'm I'm in for a donation from oh, Wheelhouse. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much, guys. And guest Mo. <laughs> Not host Mo. Yes, Mo. <laughs> um, the different, I, I've been putting up your, I believe it's Instagram or Twitter? Instagram, well, uh, yeah. Instagram, okay. Yeah. And so when you're doing things, uh, I'm going to put it up there one more time. When you're doing events, uh, do you oftentimes put things up on Instagram as well? Yeah. So that people can kind of... Because that's really what I've been promoting for you. Yeah, so. yeah. So I I put up uh, the events that we do up on our, our on our Instagram. Okay. So my personal Instagram or at Dim Events. Instagram oh, okay. Well. All right. So. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And next time you guys come in, uh, I do want to get it. And we we are long, but I want to learn more about the aging duration of wines. Yeah. Because you made mention of that, but uh, it, I know it's probably a an educational, longer conversation. <laughs> but I do want to learn because I have some wines, and I don't know if they're fantastic or vinegar by now. Yeah. You know? So how no, do we go about it? Yeah, I think, like, you know, maybe that's the next thing we talk about. Well, we can we can talk about it. Like, you know, I'm always open to people asking questions. It's probably one of my favorite things to do cool. is listen to people ask wine questions. So, yeah, we can get into it. It is, it is a little bit longer than we have time more. for. A little bit more? Okay, now, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. No, I'm just, I, I'm interested and I think there's probably a lot of people out there that want to know a little bit more because, you know, six months, two years, five years, what's good? Yeah, 100%. So, that's all I got. That, that's it from me, too. I'm, I'm, again, you're going to be, I think, our first three-timer <laughs> on, on air. I, I have so it. much fun with you on. I yep. had a blast with you as well, Mo. Thanks, um, John, and for, for, for next week, I guess we don't have anything for next week other than well, we will FaceTime. Yeah, I will be got, in a sling, uh, and you'll have some clips for us. Yeah, we've got uh, Dennis Rodkin coming back on and uh well he, he, portions of his interview from yesterday will be uh shared with our audience and we'll get an update on you but also uh comments on the real estate from his point of view and your point of view because it's it's great to have two yeah, professionals really kind of exactly yeah so other than that though uh yeah that's the whole show for next week and then uh, the week after that, and I don't have a graphic for it, but uh, w WGN News morning host, uh, his name is Larry, Larry Padesh. You might have yeah. heard of him. Yeah. yeah. Larry Padesh is going to come by. We're going to do an early show to fit in with his schedule, but uh, he'll be on, I believe we're going to do an 11 a.m. Uh, cool. Wednesday 
uh, in, in November. Very yeah. cool. I'm yeah. excited for that nice. as well. Yeah, me too. Well, I'll see you guys uh, in a sling next week on a FaceTime. <laughs> and then I'll see you guys in two weeks with Larry. So uh, thanks again for both yeah, of you for coming you in studio. And thank you uh, we'll see you guys on air next week at 3 o'clock. Absolutely. In three, two, one. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.